Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the joy of the Lord that's in this place. You are the God of our salvation and the joy of our salvation. Today, God, we celebrate your goodness. God, today as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us. In fact, Lord, open us up to receive it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we invite your Holy Spirit and welcome your Holy Spirit. Truly, it's not a man or a woman, the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine, but it's the Holy Spirit who comes and teaches the church. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need. Lord, we praise you and thank you for what you're going to do in this place. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and hearing the gospel, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, we pray that you bless all of our brothers and sisters, Lord. Those that are lifting up the name of Jesus and declaring your truth today, God, bless them. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, for Harvest, for the well and the way, God, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God. We thank you, God, for victory and the assemblies and four square denominations, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. We're many members of one body, working together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world, Lord. We ask that you encourage them, lift them up, bless them, heal them, strengthen them, protect them, guard them, God. May they endure to the end. Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say? Amen. 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 As you're having a seat, direct your attention to the screens. Praise the Lord. Last week that we were together, we started part number one of the pursuit of God. This week, we're going to continue. We're going to build on those concepts that we saw. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number six says this. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, capital H, speaking of God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want to just kind of refresh and remind you of some of the things that Pastor Luke brilliantly brought to us last week, and things that spoke to our hearts and encouraged us. And, and then we're going to build on those things today, so don't worry if you missed last week. We'll review, we'll refresh, we'll get everybody on the same page, and then we'll go from there. First of all, I want to remind you that God is a person with a personality, that if we don't have faith, we're not going to be pleasing to God. Why? Because we must believe that He is, that He is what? That He is God, that He is all that He says He is. And therefore, when we come to God, we must believe that. We must believe that God is a person, that he wants to have an intimate relationship with us, and that it's not enough to know about God, but that equally as important as knowing about God is knowing God himself. That we have been invited into a deep, intimate romance with Almighty God himself. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride, and therefore, we are pursuing him just as a man would pursue his bride. I, I was on vacation recently, and one of the guys that was helping out the hotel told us that, uh, you know, he's, he's working the, the uh, what is that called, where they pick up your car? Valet. There you go. That was a, I don't know why that word just flew out of my mind. But anyways, he's a valet, and he said that he met his wife because he parked her car, and, and he saw her walking away, and he chased her down, got her number, invited her to dinner, and now they're married with kids. See, in the same way, when you get a hold of who God is, that God is a person, who has a personality, and you start to get a hold of the character and nature and attributes of God, you may know about God, but then when you start to cross over to knowing God, now you've started the pursuit. Now you're doing something that's pleasing to God. Also, you remember, we talked about this last time we were together, we found out that as we pursue God, that this isn't done in the flesh, but rather this is done in faith. No other way you're gonna please God except by faith. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We were created to bring pleasure to God, so we please him by seeking him. Now, before we get into the message and what we're going to talk about today, I want to tell you a story, okay, that will kind of frame where we're going and, and what we're talking about today. I heard of a hunter back in the day that was a great hunter here in the United States, and he had heard about the game and the hunting over in Africa. And so he decided that he was going to uh, get on a, a boat 
and, and cross the Atlantic and go down into Africa, and that he was going to hunt a lion. He'd heard that that was kind of like the pinnacle of hunting. So he decided he was going to get all his gear, and so he, he takes this ship across the Atlantic, goes down there, he hires a guide, and the guide has a, has a crew that comes with him. They're on safari, and they go out, and so they're, they're hunting lions. And as they're hunting, one of the, one of the, the, the crew starts to talk in the language of, uh, of the area. And so the, 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 the man asks the guide, what's he talking about? He says, well, see that lion over there? That's, that's a very famous lion. That's, if you will, the king of the jungle, the king of beasts. And he says, I'm going to get that lion then. I'm going to go after that lion. That's going to go in my house. I'm going to stuff that lion. And it's going to become the centerpiece of my collection. And so they, they decide, okay, you want to hunt that lion? It, you know, it's very dangerous. And it's going to be very tough. And so he starts to hunt this lion, and he goes out, and they're tracking him, and they're, they're, they're going after him. They're crossing plains. They're crossing jungles. They're crossing terrain and going over mountains and hills and valleys and all this kind of stuff. And, and as they're going, the crew, one by one, is starting to fall off. They're starting to get weary. He's starting to get tired. But this man is determined, and he's pursuing this lion. As he goes, finally, he gets to a point where it starts to get crazy. It starts to get hectic. Even the guide says, you're going to have to go on on your own. I can't take you any further. You, you, you're, you're crazy. You, you're just, you know, you, you're obsessed and you, you need to stop. And the man says, no, I, I must get this lion. It must be the centerpiece of my collection. This will be my greatest trophy. And so the guide leaves him there and this man is tracking the lion. He tracks him through the night and he comes up on a hill and he finds the lion's den. He's so excited, he's so happy, and he gets in position, he's laying down in the grass, and he's got his gun, and he's got the lion in his sights, when suddenly he feels that something's wrong. Starts to think, and he starts to look at the lion that's in his sights, and he realizes this is not the same lion. This is not the lion he was tracking. Suddenly a cold sweat breaks out all over his body, and the hair on the back of his neck starts to stand up and chills, and he turns around, and he realizes that he wasn't tracking the lion, the lion was tracking him. In our pursuit of God, oftentimes we think that we're chasing after God. We think that we're tracking with God. We think that we're going after God. And yet the Bible says we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And God says it's with loving kindness that I have drawn you. No one comes to the Father except the Father bid him come. And we can only say that Jesus is Lord by the Holy Spirit. In our lives, we need to understand that our pursuit of God has to come on God's terms. That he is the greater one. He knows the terrain. He made us. He understands us. He knows us inside out. And therefore, when we are pursuing God, really God is pursuing us. And he's inviting us and welcoming us into this great pursuit, this great relationship. And we have to do it on his terms. Why? Because God is a personality. God is a person who we are aiming to please. You know you want to please those you love. My wife who's over here on the front row, my beautiful wife whom I love so much, her middle name is Joy. She truly is a joy in my life. I mean, she's just wonderful. We laugh. We have so much fun together. I love being with her. I love going on dates with her. And, and, and ladies, you can identify with this. She always wants me to pick the dates, right? Don't, don't, don't make me pick my own date. That's not romance, you know? I want you to plan. I want you to go out and, and make the dates. So one day I decided I was going to, you know, go on a date with my wife. Got the kids taken care of. Everything's all good. So I'm planning a dinner. And, you know, we kind of like to go to the new place in town. We kind of like to check out the new restaurants and that sort of a thing. And so I had heard that a restaurant had opened up. It was one of those pizza places, you know, and uh, just kind of a casual atmosphere. And, and, and it was one of the, you know, it's kind of the new thing. And so there's a lot of buzz and this and that. And so I'm thinking, oh, that'd be great. We'll go to the new place. Then we'll go to the movies right afterwards. That'll be a great date. It'll be fun. She'll be happy because I planned it. She, I didn't ask her what she wanted to do. I didn't, you know, drag it out or anything like that. So I planned this date. So here we are, we get all dressed up, kids are taken care of, we drive, we go, and we're out there. I didn't tell her what we were doing either, because I wanted to, you know, surprise, like, hey, surprise, we're at the new place, you know? We wanted to go, and we wanted to check it out, and it's going to be great, we'll, we'll have fun. So we, we start walking up, and as we're walking up, I say, hey, here's where we're going. And she looks, and her face drops. Now, I'm looking, I'm excited, right? The place is popping, there's people everywhere, you know, you, you barely can get in the door, and, and you have to stand in line, and, and, and when you sit down, you're going to be bumping elbows with everybody, and, and all the young kids are there, and the old people, everybody in between is all there, everybody's eating pizza and having a good time, and you know, you, you got to go get your tray, and you got to get your soda, and this and that, and so I'm all excited, and I'm getting ready to walk into the place, and I look over, and there's my wife, and my face drops. 
Why? Because she's staring at this going. And out of her mouth comes these words. That's not a date. (laughs) Hallelujah, sister. Why? Because she wants to be romanced. She wants to go to a place that's quiet. She wants to sit across a table with linen on it. (laughs) She wants somebody to come and serve her. She doesn't want to pick up her tray. She wants them to bring the plate to her. She doesn't want to fill up the soda. She wants somebody to bring her the sparkling water. Mammy, would you like a lemon in that? She wants to stare into these deep brown pools of masculinity. And I'll look back into her deep green, beautiful, enchanting eyes. She's telling me to stop over there in the front row. I love you, baby. She wants to talk and connect and have quiet. She didn't want to be touching anybody's elbows. She didn't know where those elbows have been. <laughs> right? Only elbow she wants to touch is my elbow. Okay? So later on, after we've connected and conversed, then when we go to the movies, we can put our hand in the popcorn at the same time and, well, hello. <sighs> right? Right? See, because I love my wife, I want to please my wife. So we did not go to the pizza place. We went to the restaurant down the way, right? We, we changed plans right then and there. Because she needs to be loved the way she receives that love. Now, we understand this is natural, but with God, it's no different. God says, I am inviting you to come and to pursue me. To come into a relationship with me. And we have to come on his terms. Can't come on our terms. Can't, can't put the crystals in the right position and, and sit crisscross applesauce and put our hands in a certain way and, and moan and groan and, and, and all that kind of stuff and attain to a higher reality. See, we've been fed alive. That that's how we can get to God. We've been told, just do whatever you want to do, and God's on the golf course, or, or you know, pray to the tree, or, uh, you know, when, whenever your heart soars, when you see the stars, that's God, that's Jesus. No, it's not. That's not how God says to come to him. In fact, God says that stuff is repulsive to him. Even though you might name it God, have the right name, you might have the right attitude wanting to get closer to God, but yet God says you have to come to me on my terms. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For those who come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not only do you have to believe in God, but you have to come to God his way. His way is diligence. God says, I want you to come to me on my terms. Notice God says diligence, not laziness, not just float through life. Whatever you want to do, you'll just somehow down the lazy river, float down, and eventually you'll bump into God. And wow, look at what I found. Isn't this great? No, there is a diligence that has to be applied. And yet our society, you know, we, we kind of slumped into the lazy thing, right? Have you noticed that? People are getting lazier and lazier and lazier. In fact, I found 10 rules of laziness. You guys want to hear? Did I hear a no? <laughs> you don't want to be convicted. Here's the lazy rules. Number one is this. The farther away the remote is, the more interested I am in what's on TV. <laughs> in fact, you could expand that for the, the really lazy. Anything further than five feet away becomes obsolete, right? How about this? If you have to say something more than once, it's not worth the energy. You guys want me to repeat that? That's not worth it. Number three, if you spill water, it will eventually dry. (laughs) Number four goes with that. You know when you're filling up the ice cube, right, cup, in the cup? If an ice cube drops on the floor, just kick it under the fridge. (laughs) You're laughing because you do it. I I, I do it with the small cubes. With the big ones, I pick them up and throw them in the sink. Sure, justify it, Pastor, justify it. Here's a, here's, a, here's a techie one, all right? Don't read the terms and conditions. Just hit accept. <laughs> I heard a good one about that. Uh, you know, I heard that on page 39 of the iTunes agreement, there's a great recipe for pineapple upside-down cake. So um, that's good. Just think on that. You'll get it eventually. Number six, don't fill up the gas until the light turns on, nor charge your phone until it says low battery. Some of the men... You can ident- don't say amen right now, okay, if you want to have a good married life going home. But, man, your wife will drive that car until the needle is on E and it drives you nuts. Go fill up some gas or ask me to do it. I'll do it. Um, how about this? Number seven, if you're late, don't go. 
It's a lazy rule. Number eight, why make the bed when you're just going to mess it up again tonight? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Number nine, here's another tech, techie one for our day and age. If it doesn't come up on the first page of your internet search, it just doesn't exist. Last one, number 10. You want to hear number 10? I'll tell you later. <laughs> God asked us to come to him with diligence, not to be lazy, not, not to be like the rest of the world. You can't float through life and expect to find God. You have to come to him diligently. You have to diligently seek and pursue God. Now, what is diligence? Diligence is this, being so determined and so passionate that you will exhaust all of your power in the search. In every area of your life, every part of who you are, all of your resources, all of your power, all of your strength, all of your thoughts, all of your energy, that if you're being diligent, then you are going to be so determined that you can't get off of it. You're going to be so passionate that it consumes you. And that you will exhaust all of your power, all of your energy and resources in the search. You say, well, pastor, hold on a second, because if I do that, I'll never work. I'll never spend time with my family. I'll never rest. Aren't those things important? Yes, they are. And I'm not asking you to put those things aside. I'm asking you to be diligent in those things about your pursuit of God. In other words, when you go on the job, your job is there to build the kingdom of God. And you are seeking after God who, did you know that God is a worker? Right? Six days God worked, the seventh day he rested. But Jesus says, even from the time began, my father and I have been working. And so when you go to work, you are seeking after the heart of God. God, how is it that I can become more like you? How is it that I can become excellent in my work? How can I serve this earthly master as working unto the Lord and bring glory to you, God? How is it, God, that in my job I can be a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ? How can I use the finances that you've given me to be a good steward and to build the kingdom of God? See, so you're searching God diligently in your work. What about your family life? You say, well, if all I do is seek the kingdom of God, I'll be praying and studying and, and, you know, reading the Bible and that sort of thing. I'll neglect my family. No, in your family, you seek how God wants you to build unity and love, how God wants you to walk in love, how God wants you to raise up your family, train up your children in the way they should go, and they will not depart from it even when they grow old. How you can see the heartbeat of a parent, the Father, Almighty God, how you can see husband and wife, the unity between Christ and the church. See, you're seeking God diligently in your marriage, in your home, in your family, what about your rest? You say, but if I rest, I'm not doing anything. Isn't that right? But see, even in your rest, you can be seeking God. My wife and I, we just went on a vacation last week. We missed you guys. We love you guys. But God does prescribe that we need to take a break every now and then. So we took a break. And it's amazing to me because when we go on our vacations, we always pray this prayer that, Lord, we want to be on divine assignment. God, we want to be ready. We want to be open. We want to be used by you, God, however you want us to use be used. We're open, God. We're ready. This may be our vacation, but God, you know what? We're here for you. All of our lives, everything that we are. And so we seek God on our vacation. I remember uh, there was one time we were headed up to Yosemite. As we were headed up there, we got a phone call that was just devastating. A friend of, a, uh, friend of ours called us up. Their, their relative that they were believing God to heal had died. And it was just devastating. We were so heavy hearted and we thought, God, what is your purpose in all this? God, what are you doing in all this? And, and as we left that place, we were just seeking the Lord. We were praying for this individual. They were on our hearts. And as we're checking out of the store that we were in, the guy behind us, I, I personally believe that this guy was an angel. Because as he walked up behind us, he looked grubby. I mean, he had like the cutoff jean shorts, you know, and, and like some, some sandals and a big beard and all that kind of thing, you know, and T-shirt. But he started to sing. And he started to sing Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I could still hum the tune to you today. It just resonated on the inside of me as he sang. And, and we smiled at him. We were kind of waiting to say, hey, are you a believer? Or say something to him. But he kept singing and kept singing and kept singing. And as he sang, it just ministered comfort and strength to our hearts. As we got out in the parking lot, he got on this old beach cruiser bike. We're up in the mountains. He's on a beach cruiser. He's on this beach cruiser bike just riding, and he's singing, and he's whistling. And we could have been hundreds of yards away, and yet it sounded like he was singing right in our ears. See, when you're seeking God, even in your rest, God will minister to you and will minister through you. We were able to pray from a place of strength rather than from a place of despair. 
and to believe God to comfort that family. See, God is in all things. The great scripture in the book of Psalms, King David has got a revelation. The Lord has given him an invitation, right? Psalm chapter 27, verse number 8. David says to God, when you said, so he had a revelation from God. He heard the word of the Lord. When you said, seek my face. My heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. In other words, to everything, there is a revelation and a response. If we're going to seek God, we have to seek God on his terms. Therefore, we need the revelation. God says, seek me. God says, be diligent. When you seek me with your whole heart, then I will be found by you. Therefore, we get that revelation. It requires a response. So here's God saying, seek my face. Our hearts should respond, your face, Lord, I will seek. Why? Because God is a person whom we love. God is a person who we want to please because we love him and we want to please him. The best way we please him is by diligently seeking him, pursuing the pleasure of God. Today, I want to talk to you about a couple of things, a couple of things that we can do to pursue the pleasure of God. A couple of quick things. First one is this. We can pursue the pleasure of God in a diligent spiritual walk. If we're diligent about our spiritual walk, it will bring pleasure to God. Let me show this to you in the Word. You're there, and he was turning me back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 8. The Apostle Paul is writing and talking about our life. We used to live life in the flesh before we were saved. Now we live life in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse number 6, let's read together. It says this, For to be carnally minded is death. Now, what does that word carnally minded mean? Carnal is a, is a word that we, we understand we use. Some of my Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters out there, you know that chili con carne, right, is chili with meat. Is that true? Okay, so he says to be carnally minded, or can I say to you like this, to be a meathead is death. That, that's the San Bernardino translation, in case you were wondering. Okay, so the carnal mind is enmity against God, verse number seven. The carnal mind... Back to seven, guys, is enmity with God. That word enmity means it's war against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, not talking about the Ten Commandments, talking about the law of love, the law of Christ now, that we do those things that are pleasing because we love the Lord. It says, nor indeed can be. In other words, if you're going to operate in the flesh, you cannot be pleasing to God. This is exemplified in the next verse, verse number eight. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Plain and simple, right out there for you. If we walk in the flesh, we're going to be displeasing to the Lord. Now, we know, man, I want to live a life that pleases God. So we get a revelation that if I'm in the flesh, if I'm in sin, not pleasing to God. Verse number 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Therefore, if you're saved, if you're born again, if you are a Christian, you are now in the Spirit. And so now we need to be diligent about living life in the Spirit. Now, let me ask you some easy questions, okay? I want you to answer out loud, okay? And I want you to answer what you know the answer to be. You're not in trouble if you answer these questions right, okay? Now, here's the first question. Is sin pleasing to God? No. no. Is sin pleasing to us in the flesh? Yes. Yes, it is. The Bible declares that. It says sin has its pleasure for a season. Now, if it's not enough for us to get out of sin because it's pleasing to us, it should be enough for us when we walk in the Spirit to get out of sin. Why? Because sin is displeasing to God. And because you love God, I'm not taking God to the pizza place. Come on, somebody. We're going to treat God how God wants to be treated. I'm going to connect with God the way that God wants to be connected with. And therefore, I will get out of sin in order to please God. You're there in Romans. Turn a couple books over past First and Second Corinthians to the book of Galatians. Galatians now, chapter number 5. Let's see this in the Word. Galatians chapter 5. The Apostle has just written down a laundry list of things that happen when we get in the flesh. There's division, there's dissension, there's drunkenness, there's revelries, there's, uh, there's lust, there's carnality, there's, there's fornication. There's all sorts of bad things that happen when we get in the flesh. They're natural products of the flesh. But then... 
we can get in this legalistic mentality and this mindset and we can be almost hopeless because I've, I've battled that before. I haven't been able to overcome. And, and, and you're telling me not to do this. And I thought that Christianity was just you know, a laundry list of do's and don'ts, but I can't do that. Therefore, maybe I should just give up. No, it's uh, much simpler than that. Because God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us now and says that if we do this, look at Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. Look at what he says. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, it's that simple. If you are walking in the flesh, you're going to do things that are displeasing to God. You're going to end up in sin. You're going to go the wrong way. You're going to try and connect with God and it's not going to work. You're going to hit a wall. And yet he says, if you want to please God, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So therefore, what we have to do is we just have to cross over. We have to get our minds hooked up with the spirit of God on the inside of us. And now we will do things that are pleasing to God. We will put the flesh under and walk according to the spirit. Which brings us to the second thing. Not only a diligent spiritual walk, but if we're going to pursue the pleasure of God, we have to do it in diligent obedience. Diligent obedience. Obedience. Now, Jesus was the perfect example of obedience, right? The Bible says he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And you remember, Jesus left us an example of obedience to follow. And therefore, Jesus says, I'm now giving you the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill my word and to walk in obedience. Remember when Jesus came to John the Baptist? Here's John. He's baptizing at the Jordan River. Jesus comes on the scene. He points him out. He says, the Lamb of God, uh, I was the one who baptized you with water, but he's who I spoke of concerning, saying that he would baptize you with fire. His sandal strap. You know, I'm not even worthy to loose his sandal strap. And so Jesus comes to John, and John uh, is, is just in awe, and Jesus says, I, I want you to baptize me. And John says, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. No way. I'm not baptizing you. I, I'm not worthy. You should be baptizing me. I'm the sinful man here. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. I'm not doing it because I'm sinful. I am the perfect spotless lamb of God. I'm doing this in obedience. Let this be done to fulfill all righteousness. So John gets the picture and he takes Jesus. He baptizes him. As he baptizes him, he goes down in the water. He comes up out of the water. Heaven is opened up. Heaven is rent, the book of Mark says. It's just ripped open. <laughs> Right, like a sheep being torn. Never to be the same again. The Spirit of God descends on Jesus like a dove. And at that point of obedience, a voice comes from heaven in Matthew, the third chapter, verse number 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. In other words, the example that Jesus left us was that obedience is pleasing to God. Plain and simple. When we live a life that lines up with the word of God and we obey the word which we have heard, our obedience is now pleasing to God. Now, it's no difference with us than it is with Jesus. You're there in Galatians, turn with me to the book of 1 John, kind of towards the back of your Bible. Find 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3. Let's take a look at it. This is for our lives today. Jesus left the example, but now we see it applied directly and specifically to us. First John chapter 3, verse number 22, look at what it says. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Now, that's answered prayers right there. How do we get answered prayers? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, we understand this with our children, right? If my kids are good and they eat all their vegetables like I told them to, when they ask for ice cream, sure, you can have a scoop of ice cream. You ate all your vegetables, right? There's a reward. Uh, maybe maybe they, they, they got good grades and, and they've been asking for a long time, I want to go down to the toy store. I've got a gift card. I want to buy that new video game. Well, you got good grades? Yeah, sure. Let's go, let's go spend your money. Come on. Right? Or maybe they're a teenager and, and they've been doing really good. They haven't been getting into the, the stuff that other teens are into, you know, and you see the group of friends that they have, godly friends, always going to youth group. And they ask, Dad, can I drive the car and go to youth group myself tonight? Sure. Sure, just bring it back on top and put some gas in. I've been giving you money for chores. You better put some gas. <laughs> Don't be lazy and leave it on E for me to fill up. Right? But if the kids are messing around, right? Kids don't eat their vegetables. You're not getting any ice cream. Mm-mm. You better eat those vegetables. You will sit at that table until it's cold and dry and until you fall asleep drooling on the table. You want to go to the toy store and you got F's? No, those video games are taking you away from your studies. You need to dive into your studies. When you bring those grades up, we can talk about it. 
but not until then. And if they've been messing around, those teenagers have been messing around, what makes you think I'm going to give you the car so you can go drive around and mess around? Nuh-uh. No way. I will drive you to youth group. I will sit next to you. I will hold your hand. I will embarrass you. We need some more embarrassing parents out there. Come on, somebody. Hello. I'll get off that soapbox. We need to be diligent. See, when we are pleasing to God. See, if you're out of sync with God and God blesses you, you'll stay out of sync because you think your lifestyle's okay. And yet we live however we want to live. Monday through Friday, Sunday comes around, we're asking God for stuff. And God says, excuse me, you have not been pleasing to me. You've not been doing what I asked you to do. What makes you think I'm going to bless you? Now, other times, it may not be sinful, but we just haven't fulfilled what God has called us to do. But did you know that the Bible takes us a step further and says, the good that we know to do but we do not do, to us that's sin. And the Bible says that everything that does not come from faith is sin. Romans chapter 14, verse 23 at the end. And so we need to watch ourselves that we're walking in obedience to God's commands. Why? Because when we ask, we receive from him because we obey his commands and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's when God says, I can bless you. See, if you haven't been getting answered prayers, maybe it's time to repent. Maybe it's time to change. Maybe it's time to get rid of the sin in your life. Maybe it's time to get rid of the movies or the books or the, the internet or whatever it is. Maybe it's time to change phones and go to the flip phone, the old school one with the buttons on it, rather than the smartphone that gets you in places that aren't so smart. Hello? We need to, can we talk in church? Is it okay? Because this stuff is dragging people to hell. And yet we're just shining it on, no, it's okay, you know, just to live out. No! God wants us to seek him and to pursue him, and he gives us an avenue and a way, and we need to talk about it. If you're not getting answered prayers, go back to the last thing God told you to do and see if you did it. Because if you haven't, go do it. After you do it, I guarantee you'll most likely get answered prayers. Now, there's other reasons why prayers don't get answers. Maybe it's not the timing. Maybe it's not the will of God. Uh, maybe the answer is no, you know, something like that. But, but <laughs> it's the truth. Maybe you need to grow to a place before God gives something to you. But, but, you know, if you've been praying and believing God, start with the start. Start with obedience. Start with pleasing God. And as you do, prayers start to get answered. Can you say amen? Last one for today. We'll go quickly through this one, and that is this, diligent faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Now here's the apostle, the great apostle to the Gentiles, right? Peter went to the Jews. Paul went to the Gentiles. And here he is. He's preaching the gospel, and he's setting up churches. And he says, we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. God gave us the message of Jesus Christ. And so we've been proving ourselves trustworthy. And just like... We believe, therefore we speak. He says, even so, we speak, right? We believe in the gospel, therefore we speak, not as pleasing men. Did you know that if the apostle Paul was a man pleaser, we would not have the church as it is today? In fact, if the apostle Paul was a man pleaser, we would not have the Bible as it is today. If people throughout the ages were man pleasers. No one would know who Mother Teresa is. No one would know who Corey Ten Boom is. No one would know who Martin Luther is, who nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Catholic Church. Why? Because he would be patty caking with them. Well, I guess it's okay for you to sell indulgences to people, and I guess it's okay for you to do stuff that's not found in the Bible. I, I, you know what? I just want to be liked by everybody. Maybe we can be friends, you know? But no. See, we're not here to please man. We're here to please God, and that takes faith. You walk in obedience, and you live out your faith. The story of a man who was a piano player, concert pianist. His mastery of the keyboard was amazing. This guy could just blow your mind. He's working on a doctorate's degree. And according to his professor, this young man had abilities that leave his peers far behind. To the casual listener, his mastery of the piano is both enjoyable and amazing. But to the informed listener, his mastery is nothing short of incredible. Now, this man is a brilliant example to each and every one of us of what faith is all about. You see, this pianist has limited hearing. He's able to hear and enjoy the notes in the lower register of the piano, but as the notes get higher, they become dimmer to his ear. And there are sections of the keyboard which he never hears. 
See, had this young man simply just chosen to play only the notes that pleased him, only the notes that he could hear, he would still be great. He would still be talented. He would still be very gifted. But yet he wouldn't be outstanding. But he has chosen to play notes that he will never hear. And he only knows those notes are there because why? He sees them on the score. His teacher and his coach tell him that they're there. He feels the keys, he feels the vibrations, and he knows that something's going on, and he hears the audience's pleasure when he plays those notes. But he himself never hears the notes. In our life, it's no different. See, in our life of faith, we're going to be playing notes that we will never hear. Sometimes when you give, it hurts, and you don't see anything take place. But you did something in faith. You played the key. Sometimes in our life, when you love with no reciprocation, you don't hear anything. Sometimes in life, God calls us, I want you to forgive them. And yet, when we forgive, we get nothing back. We don't hear the notes. And yet God in heaven is smiling and leaning back, listening to the beautiful sound of the chorus that you're playing to his ears. We're not here to please man. We're here to please God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 9 says, So we make it our aim, whether absent or present, to be well-pleasing to him. What did we learn today? We learned that diligence is the way that we approach God. We're pursuing God, but really God's pursuing us. If we're going to pursue God, we have to pursue God his way. His way is by being diligent. What is diligence? Well, diligence is to be so determined and so passionate that we'll exhaust all of our power in the search. We learn that if we're going to pursue the pleasure of God, we've got to do it in three ways. First of all is through diligent spiritual walk. Second is through diligent obedience. And finally, diligent faith. Did you guys get something from the word of the Lord today? Come on, let's give God a great big praise in this place. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys. Thank you guys for staying. Uh, I know there were some that got up and left, but I've got speakers out there in the foyer. I got speakers in the breezeways. I got speakers in the bathrooms. Hello. And so I want you guys to listen up. God wants to speak to you wherever you're at, all right? No one get up, no one leave during this time. I want to just talk to you about your life for a second. You would be mad at me if I took a bottle of poison and I ripped the old label off with the skull and crossbones and I put a new label on it that said peppermint extract. You'd be mad at me. Why? Because that could kill me and your actions can affect my life. And yet, when it comes to spiritual things, we don't want to hear about things like heaven and hell. We don't want to hear about things like legalism or religion. We want to be told that whatever you do is fine. We want the bottle of poison to have the label that says peppermint extract. And yet today, I love you enough not to do that. Love you enough to tell you the truth and put the right label on the bottle. And tell you that if some of you in this place don't turn around and be aware that you're going to be drinking a bottle of poison because it's been labeled wrong all your life. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Here's what I'm talking about. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people answer that question. They say, well, I'm going to heaven because hell's not real. No, hell is very real. It's in the Bible. Old and New Testament, Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And you can't avoid it just by denying its existence. It's like burying your head in the sand and saying, I'm not going to get touched by the wind. It doesn't work. And I want to make sure you don't go to hell. Why? Because I love you. God loves you. Sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross so that you didn't have to go to hell. Today, let's talk about your life. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to go to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. You just do whatever you want to do, you'll make it there. But listen, that's a bottle of poison that's going to drag you down and kill you. Why? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven. That's like us saying all roads lead to the moon. Just drive around the earth however you want, and eventually you'll make it to the moon. No, one way you're going to get to the moon. The same way Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way, just like we talked about. There's a revelation and a response. And today... You need to get the understanding of how 
it is that we can get to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, I know how to get to heaven. It's just by being good. You just be good enough, you'll make it to heaven. I've been good, giving money to charities, helped people out. It used to be bad, but I cleaned up my act. Now I've been good, you know, and, and, and I believe that my good outweighs my bad. Therefore, God's going to see that and appreciate that, and he's going to let me into heaven. But the problem with that thing is, you know that nowhere in the Bible say we can be good and just be good enough and get to heaven? It doesn't say clean up your act and, and that's what counts, or give money to charity, be nice to your neighbors, any of that kind of stuff. In fact, the Bible says our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. Going to get thrown out. Romans chapter 3 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it just by being good. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to make it to heaven because I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? To get to religious classes, Sunday school, catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible to say that you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, that makes you a Christian? Then the Bible says you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened, or because you're born in America, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that because you're not some other religion, like I'm not a Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindu, therefore I get to go to heaven. It doesn't say that. Nowhere in the Bible says that because you're not some other religion, that by default God loves you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. You say, but wait a second, Pastor. Not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. And while that's great, and I'm glad you're here, did you know that nowhere in the Bible they just say just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian? It's like me saying, I'm a Dodger. And so I put on a Dodger uniform, drive down to Los Angeles, go sit in the dugout in Dodger Stadium, bring my bat and my ball and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a Dodger. Same way, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. So you might be thinking, I get that, Pastor, but, uh, you know, at my last church, I got involved. I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card. You talked about membership today. I got a membership card. And while that's great, I'm glad you did those things. Now we're back to good works, aren't we? You can't do enough to work your way into heaven. No one in the Bible say God's looking for your volunteer hours sheet or your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. Not about logging hours. God's looking for more than that. That's a bottle of poison that will drag you down kill you. Some of you might be thinking, okay, pastor, I got you on this one. Someone told me that if I know God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus, know about Easter and the resurrection, just celebrated it. Celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean something? Yeah, it means that you know about God. But remember, we talked about not just knowing about God, but knowing God personally. You know that the demons, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can find that in the Word. Jesus would show up and they'd say, Jesus, Son of God. They believe he's the Son of God. They're not Christians. You know, the Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. Not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with him, but rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. All the way through the Bible, God's looking for your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know, I know, our society has mislabeled that bottle too. It made it out to be poison. It made it out to be some weirdo thing that you and me, we don't want to have any part of it. My goodness. And yet, not about what society, Hollywood movies, books, television, or the internet say. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty gross and graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, your call. 
your choice. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just what we're talking about, to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call. You can respond right now to the revelation that you've been given. Or you can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Your call. Your choice. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and I'm going to go bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Mm-hmm. You might be. Let's push past that embarrassment today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. And yet the devil's going to try and talk you out of it right now. Insecurity is going to try and hold you back. Listen, listen, that's a bottle of poison. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. Let's go on with God, giving him all of our heart, all of our life. If you need to do that in this safe and friendly church service today, you can. No one's judging, criticizing, condemning. We love you. We've all done this to tell you the truth at one point or another, in one way or another in our lives. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure in this place today? Come on, make sure before you leave this place. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, get ready to get right with God. Simply raising your hand. All across the auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're out watching by television in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, come on, get your hand up, and then tell an usher right afterwards, come into the church service. Online, across the nation and around the world, God sees where you're at right now. You can raise your hand and then click the button, respond to God, or go to our homepage, How to Know God. And someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. God bless you. Five up there. Thank you. Six, seven. Got you over there. Eight, got you right there. Thank you. Nine, ten. Thank you. Up top, 11, 12. Got you over there. Thank you. 13, 14. Got you right there. 15, back there. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. 15 wise people. Who else today? You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life that I did not already see. 15 wise people already. Thank you. 16, got you right there, my man. Who else today? About 16 wise people. Anybody else that I did not already see? You're saying, man, I want to make sure that I'm included in this. Just get your hand up in a moment. Thank you. Got you back there, number 17. Who else today? Who else today, number 17? Anybody else? You know, listen, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Come on. Let's get the right label on the bottle. Let's go for God today. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? I'm going to wrap this thing up. Don't miss this opportunity. Last chance to join in on this. Come on. Get your, get your hand up right now. Anybody else? All right. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. About 17 wise people. Amen. All right. All 17 of you, if you're number 18, 19, 20, 21, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late for you either. And while we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. As we do that, I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies up here today. Can't do that until we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. You raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on down to the front. Let's make your way to the front right now. Come on. Come on. Amazing love, how can it be? They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. My King will die for me. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Amazing love, I know is true. From the family rooms, you can bring your children. Come on down right now. This is for you too. It's for your children. Amazing love, how can be? Anybody else, if you need to come, you just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. My King will die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Thank God you guys have come. Now, listen, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. 
glad that you guys came today. I want to introduce you all to a friend of mine. See this guy over here waving at you? Am I right? You love this Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird goes on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Ah, he's cool. All right. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. You're not wondering or worried. Okay. First thing he's going to do is he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Let me describe it to you like this. It's a friend in church who will come alongside you and help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. All right? Just that simple. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you, okay? Now, listen, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year, one year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, sitting consistently under the teaching. If you can make it to Sunday morning at 10 a.m., come on, all right? If you can make it to Sunday night at 6, come on. Uh, you know, Wednesday night at 7, girlfriends 9.30, all right? In the morning, young adults ministry Friday night, 7.00. Whenever you can make it to church, get into church consistently. And at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. I promise you will look around your life and say, my goodness, I did not know I could be this blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? It's going to rock your life. All right? So you guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.